You're listening to the No Schedule Man podcast with Kevin Bulmer, exploring real stories and lessons learned with a variety of special guests. To learn more about Kevin and to access other episodes of the podcast, please visit NoScheduleman.com and connect and contribute at No Schedule Man on Twitter or Instagram and on Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud, all backslash No Schedule Man. Thanks for listening and enjoy the No Schedule Man podcast. Hi, it's Kevin. Thanks for finding the podcast. We'd love for you to join us online as well. You can find our community on Facebook at facebook.com slash no schedule man or on Twitter at no schedule man. Our website, kevinbolmer.com. My last name is B U L M E R or no schedule man.com goes to the same place. That's home to all things related to this podcast as well as periodic blog postings, my music. And the No Schedule Man store where you can go and get some cool summer gear. So go have a look. For today's show, we're going into the broadcasting world for what I found to be a really fascinating discussion with my good friend and current colleague, Lisa Brandt. Lisa is a radio host, author, voice artist, blogger, painter, motorcyclist, (laughs) and many other things. She's currently the morning show co-anchor and lead news person with News Talk 1290 CJBK here in London, Ontario as well as providing a wide range of voiceover work through Lisa Brandt Creative Services. Her broadcasting career includes a long run as the co-anchor in the largest market in Canada at 680 News in Toronto. She ended up leaving that job on her own to come to London, but we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. Lisa writes a semi-regular national column for Sun Media. She blogs daily and has written and made available four different books. They're called Celebrity Tantrums, Venus Rising, The Naked Truth, and My Sepsis Story. We talk about all of that and more. I found this chat to be a fascinating window inside the world of news, broadcasting, writing, and quite frankly, life in general. Here's my conversation with Lisa Brandt on the No Schedule Man podcast. How do you govern how much of each thing that you're interested in gets what amount of energy it gets that's an interesting question because that's something that i think about a lot and other people have asked me um it's just whatever is going at the time for example i paint i haven't done a painting in probably a year just because it hasn't really interested me right now um so it's just whatever uh sort of taps my imagination Um, when I get an idea for a book, um, I'm all about that. And to the exclusion of everything else, I don't stop one Sunday afternoon and go, gee, I'd like to paint something or whatever else, or I'm going to build this piece of furniture. It's that. So it doesn't all exist all at once. It looks like I do so many different things and I do, but I do them in, in pieces. You know, it's not all like a, a stew. It's one entree at a time. You still blog every day, correct? I do that, yeah. That alone, (laughs) I guess once you build that muscle and you're into that habit, it becomes part of the rhythm and the routine. But you've got to be waking up at, I'm guessing, what, 3 o'clock each morning-ish? Yeah. Yeah. To be on the air at 6 and... well, there's a little thing called scheduling in the in the blog program, too. Sometimes I write three at a time and schedule them ahead. And then I'll go in at the last minute before one of them's going to publish and go, no, I don't want to do that now. I want to do this. I thought of this better. But I, I kind of always have a couple in reserve for those days when I have nothing in my brain because they happen. When I haven't got an idea or nothing has grabbed me or I will do something and think, oh, that's so negative. That's just crabby. I don't want to, I don't want to publish that. I have, I have some in reserve. Only a couple though. I mean, right now my quiver is empty <laughs> and it makes, it gives me anxiety because I think, oh, well, I've got to come up with something. I have to figure something out here. Um, and I used to do it seven days a week. And then I finally said, ah, five, five will do Monday to Friday because <laughs> seven was like, well, what am I what am I doing? I mean, people don't write columns that much. Well, and then there's the House Proud column on top of that. Yeah. How often do you do that? It used to be every two weeks religiously. And then lately it's been kind of sporadic because I'm one of those sort of um, – I've become, with a different editor, one of those sort of filler writers – 
for that. So it's like, well, we don't need you this time, you know, and that's fine because then I go, hmm, uh, this will leave me room for something else I can do, which is who knows what, you know, I don't, these things come and they go. Um, I used to write a column for the Toronto Sun on small business when I had a, a jingle studio with a partner. And uh, that thing ended, and I thought, oh, darn, I really enjoyed doing that. They completely revamped the section. And about two weeks later, um, an editor took over who knew that I loved decor and all that kind of stuff, and House Proud was born. So these things, I, I find that if I don't get uptight about them, these things just naturally flow and something will come along to replace it and maybe what will replace it is a nap that would be okay too yeah and instead here you are burning daylight with me oh that's all right <laughs> this is good <laughs> which came first uh the desire to write or the passion for news and broadcasting oh definitely news uh it's funny though um i had you know what i shouldn't say definitely i had a, a journalism um class ring from high school and my guidance counselor was putting pressure on me to ask me you know what what are you going to do with your life and I and I'd already picked out this journalism little ring and um, I looked over his shoulder and there was a broadcasting <laughs> brochure and I went I want to go into radio and it was that simple and and then I went geez I really do want to go into radio I love radio why radio as opposed to television uh, well, I did television too, and I, I actually the course I took was radio and TV. But you know, I always had um, a bit of a I don't know about a chip on my shoulder about about television. But I auditioned for things early on that I didn't get, and uh, there seemed to be some sort of intangible thing with television that I didn't understand or didn't get. I would get here's an example. I auditioned for something at City TV one time, and as soon as I walked in, the producer looked at me and she went. We've already got like 25 of you because I'm a white brunette, average in just about every way, not a supermodel, not blonde, not statuesque. I was just, just, you know. Human? Not special. Yeah. Not special to <laughs> we them. We already have too many of those. Yeah. She actually said that to me and um, it was kind of funny. Not at the time, but it's funny now. So radio was the path, and specifically, news was the passion. It was, but you know, the first job I was offered was uh, DJ, country music, overnights, Red Deer, Alberta. <laughs> so tell me, tell me a little bit about that. There, well, ha there have to be a couple of stories anyway. I was working at CJRN in Niagara Falls while I was going to college in Niagara and um, just doing part-time stuff. And I thought, you know what, I could just go back to school and just keep doing this or I could go out and everybody says go west and seek your fortune so I went to Calgary drove out to Calgary and sent out old reel to reel tapes I sent out six and I got four responses one was a phone call with uh, a request to come in and do an audition and that was Red Deer Alberta and it was CKGY it's now called KG Country it's on FM it was AM then and uh, I came in and did an audition, and they gave me the, the show. And so it was overnight, all request, with no guidance, no nothing. And I was terrible, terrible. And, um, you know, like, I okay, here's an example. You'll totally get this. One of, the, um, one of my jobs, the afternoon drive guy had this special van that he went out and did on, on location shows every single day. One of my jobs was to put his commercial reel together so that when he you know was going to commercial, he just pushed a button and he'd have his two minutes of spots or whatever, then he'd come back. I put all the spots back to back to back to back to back to back to back with no breaks. So this poor guy is doing his show. He plays three songs. He has a guest on. He does whatever. And then he says, and here's, you know go to a break and it's like 19 minutes of commercials <laughs> <laughs> that uh, friends is what we call a two note factor mm. <laughs> well he had to stop the thing and try and you know you cue it up so that you 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 get the whole thing and, and it was too tight and oh and it was just you know they were so nice to me because i was just so you green no yeah i didn't know i didn't know i thought i was doing you know, now when I think about it, I think, how could I have thought that? That doesn't make any sense in the world. But I was trying to be diligent. So how fair is it to say that even prior to that, that your aspirations were initially 
to news. As oh, a... definitely. I, I, my tape that I sent out, my my reel to reel tape, was news. So uh, I want. I'm interested to explore this because it's something that I've always been curious about. Because there are radio people and broadcasting people. Television is not the same as radio. There are skills that can be transferable, of course. Like somewhat like yourself. I started out in a radio and television uh, arts program. And interestingly, I think for for me, my passion then was post-production stuff in TV. I was good at the in front of the camera stuff, but there was just something about it that didn't resonate with me. Uh, but radio I liked. But getting it back to, to the news thing, the news never appealed to me so much as just sort of the personality side. And I've always kind of thought, Lisa, that an interest in journalism and and news as its own kind of entity is a unique passion unto itself. And I've always been a little curious as to why, and I'm wondering if you can maybe take me inside that psyche a little bit. Yeah, um, because I actually, that path of uh, being a DJ was 12 years before I circled back to news. But it made me a better newscaster because I'm fearless and because I will do things a little bit differently and it won't be just the linear hydro rates are going up 2.78 cents a kilowatt. You know what I mean? All that boring old view of radio news that hopefully doesn't exist much anymore. The thing about it is um, there is an adrenaline rush you get when a story breaks and you're trying to get the details accurate and fast because you know down the dial they're doing the exact same thing. And so it's a little bit of competition, but it's also just wanting to share information with people. Um, just being the first to tell them something is kind of cool. Um, it, it's just being a conduit, I guess, for what's going on in the world. You know, and there's a lot of editorial uh, decision making that has to be done. So there's a little bit of a um, little bit of controlling that information in a way as well. Does it still matter to be first? Well, I don't know that it does like it used to, for sure, because of Twitter and all that kind of thing. But it matters to be first if people are listening to you. See, to me, and I don't mean to sound naive, it matters who I trust. Right. If something comes across my field of awareness and I want to know more about it, Depending on what realm that's in, I'm going to have a short list of where I'm automatically going to go to Agreed. get more informed. And is there a – I mean, would you rather be one than the other? I guess you'd rather be both. I'd rather be accurate than first. Absolutely. I'd always rather be trusted and accurate than first. If you can be both, though, that's sweet. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There's nothing like um, somebody go, you know, jumping the gun, thinking that first is more important and making all sorts of mistakes. They will lose their credibility. Uh, but if you can do both, that's really cool. And you know, there's an awful lot of kids in the business right now who don't have a lot of experience at that, and they will take first before accurate. They won't take that extra second that I will always do, extra couple seconds, and double check everything. Because I want to be accurate first. So I think you nailed it as far as trust goes. But there's still that little thing where, you know, you'd like to be, you'd like to, you'd like to beat the other guy. How do you handle being exposed to the kind of content that you are on a daily basis for as long as you've been? There are days, I'll be honest with you, there are days and I think I can't, I can't take it anymore. Um, somebody hurts a child or, um, you know, there's a mass senseless death of people uh it affects it affects us just as much as anybody else but i'll give you another example 9 11 you know we were all as freaked out as anybody else i was on the air that day from 5 30 until in the morning until something like 3 30 in the in, afternoon in toronto at yeah, that time i was in toronto at 680 news and i was grateful the whole time that i had something to focus on and that was the unfolding details because when a story breaks like that, or another big story, there aren't many you can compare to 9-11, but, you know, there's all sorts of misinformation that comes out. And you have to try and figure out how you're going to decide what's 
accurate and what isn't. And you don't want to scare people any more than they are scared on a day like that. So you don't want to come out with stuff that's that hasn't been confirmed. So I had to concentrate so hard that whole day. And I was so glad later on when I when I spoke to other people who said, you know, I, I sat there and I watched the TV or I listened to the radio and all I did was worry about my kids and or whatever. I was grateful that I had something to do. So in a way, it's it's it detaches you from it in a way because you become desensitized in a way as you're doing it over and over and over again. Um, but the challenge of getting it right and of um, keeping yourself, I don't know, I don't want to use the word entertain, but keeping yourself uh, engaged and interested um, keeps your audience Engaged and interested too, I hope. I would think that there would be very little choice but to have to, you said detens- desensitized, uh, the word I was thinking of was was detached, but somehow separated from, and I don't mean to sound cold or cynical at all, but in order to preserve yourself and deliver the message to the audience, there has to be a little bit of self-preservation in there, doesn't it? And, and not to dehumanize because whatever you're reporting on, somebody is living through. Exactly. That's an actual... And that's the thing we never forget. Yeah. Um, but this will be a really silly analogy, but I can think of times where uh, in the very little bit of um, performing I've done as a songwriter, there are a few of them that mean a lot to me that when I would try to perform them, I'd just start turning to tears. And I had somebody that I I like and respect a lot pull me aside and say, you know, you're not really doing a service to the audience or to your work if you can't even get through it. You need to kind of steal yourself and almost remove yourself from it so that you can deliver it. And in, in a way, I almost wonder if the news at times has to be similar when you hear or are dealing in a world like you've mentioned 9-11 or some other stories that – um you don't want to not be human about it, but in a way, how fair is it to say that you've got to detach yourself a little bit just to be able to deliver that to the audience? Well, people handle it different ways. Uh, I, you know, there's a gallows humor in a newsroom that we develop that outside of a newsroom would make us seem like the coldest, most callous people in the world, but it is specifically because we have to go ahead when most people would put their heads down and cry. However, many times I have put my head down on the desk and cried over a news story. It's happened more times than I care to admit, especially when it has to do with a child and something horrendous and totally needless and preventable. Um, I, I'll burst into tears as I'm writing. Uh, I've done that before, but not on the air. Once you get on the air, it's for one thing, it's not to me to tell people how to feel about a story. I just give it to them and they will react how they, I, I hate adjectives in news for that reason, you know, tragic, uh, you know, devastating. It's like you decide if it's devastating. I'm not going to tell you that. I don't think that's my role. So it's also not my role to come on and, and be weepy. And, um, you know, I've got to maintain a sense of professionalism, but in the newsroom, um, getting details about stories perhaps that I wouldn't even share on the air because they don't serve the story. They're horrifying things that, you know, there have been things that as groups of journalists we've agreed we're not going to tell just because they're so disturbing. But I still have to know them. And the other thing that I've, I've often said is that the stories that we don't do on the air are often the ones that get us too. Like there'll be some awful story about animal abuse or something that comes over the wire and we all read it because we have to read it to decide whether we're going to use it. But it's just so awful that, you know, I don't even know why uh, you just can't, you can't say to somebody over their eggs in the morning, this horrific thing happened and here are the details of it. You just don't. It's just not done. How do you decide on a day-to-day newscast, a newscast basis, what goes in and what doesn't? Well, there are some stories that are just um, above any decision. Uh, The assisted dying law coming out that happened to be today. Um, The, um, you know, there are all sorts of things that are just the news that you just don't. However, uh, here's an an example of what's something that's going on right now is this um, dismemberment trial 
that um, the two Orangeville young guys at the Travelodge Hotel decide to come to London for whatever reason, and one is accused of killing the other and cutting him up and all this stuff. I won't do that story in the morning. That trial is going on every single day with the most horrific, disgusting, revolting details. Our competitor comes on with bells on and talks about the blood and the the, the depth of the knee, the knife and all this stuff. I I don't I won't do it because people are having breakfast. Their children are around them. It's just to me it's tasteless, classless and doesn't serve you in any way to know that before you go to work in the morning. If you desperately want to know about that trial, you'll find out about it. You don't need to know it from me. To me, one of the 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 main value judgments I put on a story is does somebody need to know this to be informed before they go before they go for the day? You don't need to know all that stuff. You might want to know if he's found guilty, but you don't need to know how many bags the bodies were was found in. How different in that kind of respect or in any respect related to, to news and the ongoings in the newsroom and just the competitiveness of it and the delivery of it, how different is London from Toronto? Um, London is very different from Toronto. Stories that make the news here wouldn't even be given a second glance in Toronto because there's so much more going on and there's so much more going on that's bigger. Um, however, it was amusing to me that, that there was a big story this week involving um, Native people that the big Toronto radio stations all ignored, completely ignored. And it was huge. And it has become an ongoing story, so they have had to pick it up and go with it. Um, there's a bit of cynicism there. Um, they will look at a neighborhood. They'll say, you know, some, somebody is stabbed to death, and they'll look at the neighborhood and go, ah, it's Jane and Finch. Stuff like that happens all the time. That's not news. Did it happen in Willowdale, where it never happens? Then it's a story. Value judgments put on the value of, of people's lives. Um, it's a completely different market. The stakes are much higher. Um, there's an awful lot more involvement from management. I've never had a manager come down to, to me in a, in a newsroom situation in London and tell me I have to put a story in because their son is involved in it. That happened to me in Toronto. I thought that only happened with the Flint hockey team. <laughs> I still think they should have been called the Flint Stones, not the Firebirds. But anyway, um, no, it's a uh, it's a different world. It's a different world, and yet, don't get me wrong, because I love working there and I love the people. But yeah, do you miss being in Toronto? I miss my paycheck. <laughs> that's the, that's I'm just being honest. Um, I miss some of the people. I don't miss working there. Um, I did when I was doing work that wasn't as challenging and, you know, wasn't keeping my interest as much. But I'm so busy. Um, I like where I'm working now. And you chose to come to London. I did. It was all my decision, yeah. In fact, I gave them six months' notice. And up until the last day, the big boss said he's he just was waiting for me to come to his office and say, just kidding. Six months. Yeah. That's a long time to give yourself to have the opportunity to change your mind. I knew I wouldn't, though. And the, I, I needed to give them a, lo a lot of notice. I had a pretty ironclad contract that I, that I wanted to uh, get myself out of. And, um, you know, and I, I wanted to give them a chance to, like, 680 News, for example, is, is the number one listened to station in, in the country, really. Um, I wanted to give them a, a running start to find somebody to replace me so that they did weren't blindsided by it. Um, yeah, so it was tough to leave, but it's been a while now, and, you know, things are good. What did your life look like then? Meaning, back where we started, blogging, books that we're going to get to, House Proud column, uh, voice oh, yeah. work, um, morning show co-anchor, all of these different things that you have going on here. Uh, how does, does does that compare to how it was when you were in Toronto? Well, similar, except at a crumbling marriage. 
a house that was way too big for two people, um, four bedroom or five bedroom, four bathroom for two people. Ridiculous. Um, that had been inspected by a home inspector who missed several important things. Um, animals that, uh, rescue animals that, um, were very, very demanding of my time, ruining things and, um, just hurting each other. Uh, it was a, it was a more stressful time. I had less time to myself. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of pressure in Toronto morning radio. Uh, some real, some imagined, but there's a lot of pressure. So it was, it was stressful too. Um, having said that, it was, a lot of it was enjoyable. Well, and then coming here, I'm just thinking about in the time that we've known each other, which not to date either one of us, but the years are starting to pile up on I us know, here, Lisa. I know. Um, there have been a lot of different adventures and some sideline to sideline type moves. It hasn't always been a north south journey, has it? And um, thinking about was it at what used to be the Hawk? Was that the first on air yep. spot? From because when you came to London, you didn't have another job to go to. Didn't have work. No, no, I didn't. I had savings that I thought would last me a year and a half, and I think it was four months or something. I don't know. Um, Yeah, I didn't do very well with that. No, and I got. I was doing middays at one hundred three nine. It wasn't the Hawk anymore. Uh, They had changed it to Greatest Hits one hundred three nine. So I did the midday show there. Right, and that wasn't really the happiest spot for you. Well. You know, I mean, I was glad to be working there. There are some great people there, of course. too. Great people. Um, and, you know, I've made friends that have lasted long since I left there and, and we're friends today. But it was like going back in time. I was a little bit of a fish out of water. I did the best I could. Uh, when a new boss came in just before I left, he said, you sound corny. <laughs> Well, He's when like, you, okay, I'll leave you alone then. When you're going <laughs> from the, you know, the top listened to news station in the biggest market in the country and one of the largest ones in North America, in the environment that you just described, to a completely different city rhythm, and rather than dealing with all those news issues that you just described so well, you're and not to diminish this in any way, but you know. Hey, that was so and so was such and such, and then now coming up, it's and then hitting that post is an entirely different. Right, it like, was like going back in time because I it, wasn't like I was a jock for a long time, but you know what? I was grateful to have a job, and um, I knew that it wasn't going to be easy. I, I interviewed for a bunch of things, and it's funny one one manager. I'm sure he brought me in just so he could tell me I wouldn't have the job because he thought I thought I was all that, and. I didn't think I was all that. I wanted to work and I need to work. And so I was happy to be working. Um, it was a little frustrating sometimes, but I learned I learned how to program the music. I learned a whole bunch of things. And, uh, um, you know, mostly I was happy to be there. And if I remember correctly, and this is going to take us down another tangent here, but when you got very sick with sepsis, mm-hmm. which you didn't know that that's what it was for a great long time, but we'll get into that maybe. Uh, if I remember correctly, they were very good to you about that. Well, they didn't have a choice. Uh, they, I mean, I was just so sick. I wasn't coming back. Um, I'll tell you something, though. No one sent me a get well card from that place. Not even a card. I thought that was kind of odd. Hmm. Weird, eh? But anyhow, um, yeah, because I was in the hospital for more than two weeks and stuff, and and so they didn't really have a choice. My boss had had quit and and left for somewhere else. It was all kind of in disarray. Um, don't get me wrong; people called and, and all kinds of stuff, but the, but the station never. I just I just kind of felt it just felt weird. Um, yeah, so they, you know, I mean, I went on I went on disability like you do, and. And they brought me back uh, a little at a time, which was really great. And I'm looking. trying to remember if you and I were, was it before or after that? I think it was before that I somehow dragged you out to Delaware Speedway. <laughs> yes, it was, was it before. before that? It was before because I was working at 1039 at the time. And I came back from from recovering from sepsis and six, five or six weeks later resigned and went to Free FM. So, yeah, it was definitely before. Okay. Yeah, that's, I don't know. <laughs> 
When I tell people I spent a summer in that tower um, doing my best to craft some race reports, they just look at me like they, they can't believe it. I don't even honestly, Lisa, remember the details of how that all came together. And I don't know that it's <laughs> worth our, our That's time okay. to do this. But, That's okay. Uh, um, I'll tell you, it doubled my salary. So I was pretty happy to do it. <laughs> Glad it doubled your salary. <laughs> So when you got to Free FM then and you're back in the newsroom, that must have been somewhat of a breath of fresh air to be back kind of more of what aligned with what your original passion was. Yeah, and and doing mornings again. I, I said when I left Toronto, I told everybody, I'm done with mornings. I want to get sleep. I want to have a normal life. I want to go out in the evening. I want to do all these things. And I did that when I was at, at 103.9. But when it came right down to it, you know, mornings are where I – seemed to fit better um and i was excited about it yeah absolutely so now you're still doing mornings and settled again firmly into that news routine at 1290 cjbk enjoying working with mike very much That's, very much he's awesome yeah if you don't um if you can't get along with mike stubbs you might want to have a really firm look in the mirror exactly <laughs> he's terrific and ryan spence everybody's great yeah yeah we got a lot of good people we're yeah. really lucky with with that how has the news changed you mentioned earlier twitter uh and there are others where you have the tmz's of the world and whatnot um from where you're sitting and juxtaposing it from your experiences from 10, 15 years ago, how is it different, at least as it maybe affects your day-to-day or how news is delivered on the radio? Well, it used to be that The Wire was king. It used to be called BN, now it's CP, Canadian Press. And um, it was if it didn't come out on The Wire, you probably didn't know about it. And now they're just, the sources are everywhere. Because I'm uh, with CTV News, I can record something from Canada AM if if they happen to have a story first. And I have that where other others don't in the market. Um, you know, Twitter, um every everything is a potential source. Tipsters even, people calling in with seeing a fire or a, or something. Um that is something that's really grown and developed in the last 10, 15 years as well. I remember a, a story that um, one of my coworkers told me about when I was in Wingham many years ago about how they had these two news anchors working together. One was the old guy who, you know, thought he was Walter Cronkite and the younger guy. And they would get in to go and anchor the news together. And the old guy would pull the story out from under his chair that he had pulled off the wire and saved on actual paper and not told the other guy about so that he would have the big news story. That kind of ridiculous stuff can't happen anymore. That's very quaint and and amusing to me, knowing both of those men. But um, now it's just... You know, you just have to be watching absolutely everything. Everything. What is the kind of thing that would happen that ha- would make you go home feeling like that was a great day? Having a good lineup in the news where I was sure I had the top story and the other things that need to be in there. There are very few days like that. Most days it's like, mm, I don't know, let's let's fly this one up a pole. And it it's, shouldn't sound like that. It shouldn't seem like that. But I think if anyone's honest with you, a lot of the time it's by gosh, by golly. The days where you have a firm, absolute certainty are very few. What about the delivery of it? After all this time, is it... Do you- is it something that you even allow yourself to devote any energy to thinking to? Absolutely. I try and read aloud at least one of my newscasts before I go go on air um, because I will find mistakes I've made um, and, and get them out before I, I take it to air. I'm disappointed with my delivery many times when I get off the air. I want to do better. I want to not have stumbled on that name of the Ugandan prime minister or whatever that I practiced, but still messed it up when I got on the air. You know, I, a lot of times I'm, I'm kind of disappointed with myself. I I find myself wanting to ask you a lowest common denominator question and I'm frankly embarrassed. Go for it. (laughs) No, just about 
anybody that's been on the air for any length of time has had those moments where things have not gone well. Oh, yeah. A mispronunciation <laughs> or just a... It's. I don't know how to describe it, but there are times, and it and it has happened to you if you're on the air, where your mind says that you said something, when in fact your mouth actually delivered something <laughs> quite different, and you don't know. Right. And somebody will point it out, and you're sure that can't be correct. And when it's played back for you, oh my gosh. Yep. Um, what are some things that maybe come to mind that? <laughs> You know, where maybe either some hot water was created with a an accidental mispronunciation or one of those brain-to-mouth disconnects. What comes to mind? Um, the most recent, probably classic one that I had was at Free FM where I was trying to say city and I said shitty. But instead of just correcting myself or moving on, I thought, well, I'll take it again. And I said shitty a second time. And as soon as I got off the air... For starters, I couldn't speak anymore. Like, I was just gone. I was laughing so hard without making much noise. And Blair Hanatson turned on his microphone and he said, well, that's an interesting story or something like that. And we both just ended up laughing. And I just said, I'm just going straight to sports and then went, went into sports. And when I got off the air, the hotline was ringing. And I pick up the phone and the laughter from the big guy, he said, that was the best newscast ever. Um. And later I thought, the only thing I thought about that was anybody can make a mistake like that. Why did I say it a second time? Why did I take another run at it? That was my question to myself. Um, yeah, I've said, I've said some that aren't fit for even repeating, but it's just, um, you know, you hope that, <laughs> that they pass and that nobody hangs on to them and plays them back for you. Have you ever been hit with the giggles at a most inappropriate time? Um, I have been hit with the giggles, not so much inappropriate. I remember when Marty Robbins died though, which is going way back, but I had to go on the air and say that Marty Robbins died. And, and I, I ended up somehow with a frog in my throat. And so it sounded like I was getting all choked up. Now I liked Marty Robbins. Don't get me wrong. And I did not, was not happy that he died, but I sounded like, and I didn't want to clear my throat on the air. So I sounded like I was getting all choked up. People were phoning, consoling me, and I'm like, really, it's it's okay, <laughs> you know. Like, <laughs> but I just played along. It's like, yeah, I'm all right, but oh, that that was just embarrassing to me because it just sounded like I was crying when I wasn't. Well, see, I would think that it would be the opposite of you know, l laughing, n not because you think that something bad or horrible is funny, but because sometimes. Like you mentioned, the what did you call it? The hangman's humor or something like uh, that. Gallows humor. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, and we've all been in, <laughs> regardless of what you do for a living, we've all been in that place where a combination of sheer uh, exhaustion, oh, yeah. exasperation, uh, the perfect storm clouds all come together at this one time, where it can be the oddest thing that is the match that lights the fire. And then once it's on, once that tap is turned yeah. on, um, it's called corpsing. Is that what Ricky it is? Gervais calls it corpsing where you start to laugh and you can't stop. One time at six eighty, uh, it was the beginning of the baseball season and the blue Jays had come in and not the team, but their people had come in and brought us all this blue Jays stuff and including two little stuffed blue Jays. And they put them into the studio when we were on the air. Well, as I was on air reading, and I'm going to laugh just thinking about it, Paul Cook made those Blue Jays start to love each other. <laughs> and here I am reading a story, and I can't remember what it is. And, and, he, and I started to laugh. I could not control myself. And he flicked on his mic, and he goes, what? I said, don't you what me, Mr. Blue Jays? fornicating on the uh, on the console but really we both just start, start laughing don fraser and i at cknx i can still remember us losing it over something to do with a tractor and i can't remember what it like the most ridiculous stupid things and and it's true if you start and you get the other person going it's really hard to stop but those are some of the best therapeutic uh cleansing experience it's just that you don't want to have that while you're trying to deliver information on the air. And exactly. I would think that that would be the kind of anxiety. Sounds like you've got yourself programmed to not even really think about it. But uh, I think it's all kind of a human 
uh, reaction. Like, you know, I've sneezed on the air by accident. One time I thought my mic was off and I turned it on and sneezed. (laughs) <laughs> and then I turned it off again. Um, you know, uh, I just, and then I just own up to it, you know, if if it's noticeable or whatever. And just, I figure all this stuff is just, you know, to me, being authentic and being truthful are one and the same. And uh, um, the, uh, listeners understand. So can you watch something like, say, the... <laughs> The Steve Carroll newscast scene in Bruce Almighty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I have seen it. But... Me like a do yeah. da cha cha. Like, can you enjoy something like oh, that and not get anxiety? Doesn't worry. No, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, you know, I have more anxiety about television, and and it's been a long time since I've actually done a TV show. Even though the show that I'm on is a reruns, ever people think it's still current, but um, it's definitely not. I have more anxiety about that because I've made more public faux pas there i think even though they were if they were years ago and maybe in front of a smaller audience they just they stay with you how did your first book come together celebrity tantrums um i got i was contacted by uh, ecw press because they found my blog and read a couple of my posts um, about celebrities and about a couple, couple of other things and just said, look, we're looking for authors. We, uh, you know, we're, we're this kind of house. And do you have any uh, burning ideas? And uh, my ex-husband, Ray, who was my husband at the time, the next morning I woke up and uh, he had written celebrity tantrums on a post-it note and put it on the mirror and just said, that's your title. And everything grew out of that. And so I started, I just spent five or six months researching it and finding and writing it. And um, it was the biggest tantrums thrown by celebrities. And the idea was it was supposed to be a series, supposed to be updated and new and expanded and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, there were problems with the... um, with the publisher and we didn't have a good, a good parting. I'd written a second book for them, a completely different book. And, uh, anyway, the two partners split up and, and 40 of us got, got turfed. But, um, before then it was kind of cool. They flew me to Montreal. They flew me around for TV appearances and all sorts of stuff. And the book sold like Australia and England and it wasn't a bestseller by any stretch, but it was a real fun ride. Very fun. Were you in Toronto at that time? Yes, I was. I was living in Burlington and work, driving into Toronto. Yeah. So what's the discipline like writing a book on top of being on Toronto morning radio? And- you know, it's funny. People say to me all the time, oh, if I ever find the time, I'm going to write a book. And I say, you, I'll say to them, you have the same amount of time as I do. I, w- I made a commitment to myself. I wanted to write a book so badly that I would get home. And keep in mind, too, that at that time we had two dogs. One was just a nice, normal dog. The other one was an insane rescue that never stopped barking. And so I would sit there with Louie barking constantly. And um, I would get home and write for four hours. And my rule was every night I was in bed by 7 or 7.30 so that I could at least not die. But I would write. That makes everything harder. At least four hours, yeah. But that was the deal we made, My, Ray and I, was that, okay, I'm going to devote this amount of time. You're going to, I'm not going to be around, you know, after dinner, you're, you're on your own. And, um, but, the, but I'm going to get this done. So it was a while between that and Naked Truth. Am I missing one between? No, uh, no, you're not. Um, I had written um, Venus Rising, but that was the second one I'd written for ECW Press, but I resurrected that after The Naked Truth. The Naked Truth, uh, I actually wrote as fiction. This is about my summer uh, living at a nudist camp between high school and college. Yes, it really happened. I worked there. And I had I had written a fiction book about it and gave it to um, the fiction editor, Key Porter, who was a friend of a friend. Key Porter doesn't exist, but it did back then. He loved it. But he said, yeah, it's a beach read. I said, that's what I'm going for. He goes, nah, we don't publish beach reads. So I sat on it for a while, probably a year and a half, two years, and then hauled it back out, took all the fiction out of it, and just said, I'm just going to tell the story. Um, I had read that the nudist camp uh, manager who I worked with had died suddenly at the age of 52, and it just threw me for a loop, and I thought... Maybe now's the time I should tell this story. So, what was it like for you to 
mine those experiences and have to get back into that headspace a little bit? Well, I had to keep reminding myself to be kind to myself, you know, because I knew so much more at the time I was writing than I did when I was a naive teenager. Sure. And I, so I had to remind, I had to remind myself to get back into that headspace, but also from this perspective to be kind when I explained things to not, um, not be too hard on myself over some of the decisions I made, some of the choices I made. Part of the reason why I'm asking that is selfish because I've had the same thoughts about doing something at some point about the experiences of uh, operating a stock car racetrack. Cool. I don't have an imagination vivid enough, and I have a vivid imagination, but to be able to make up the things that actually happen there. And I'm really interested to hear that you just said what you did because um, I've been finding that I reflect back on that time for me uh, with a lot more perceived negativity than anybody else seems to. You can hear it if you listen back to the first even five or six minutes of the podcast that was just before this one with Jay Dewar, uh, where I can hear myself almost being defensive. I ask him, aren't we supposed to be the enemy? And Jay's just like, why would you say that? Yeah. And in, I'm still having to try to get past... Oh, I mean, you had your head space, but everybody else was perceiving things through their own lens. And right. it sounds like you went through the exact same experience. Yeah. And, and also, I had to make sure that I didn't demonize anybody for some of the things. I mean, one of the themes that, go through the naked, that goes through the naked truth is that I didn't want to become a nudist. And there was some pressure on me. And some people did some goofy things to try and... You know, people said some mean things, all sorts of things happened. So it was, it was a real challenge to try and find the truth, even though I'm the one writing it. The truth is probably somewhere outside of me, you know, out of, outside of my perspective because sure. of my lens. But, um, but I did the best I could. It's funny reading some of the reviews. I mean, some people just love it. They know it's a little romp and they can't believe these things happen to me. Some of them are pretty odd. Uh, some people get really frustrated because they think it's supposed to be a, um, some sort of a commentary on naturism, which it is not. Um, it's just my story. I loved it. Oh, I thank absolutely you. loved it. I tore thank right you. through it. And my experience of reading it was, I thought, interesting because I thought that when I read it, I was going to be pic picturing a little you running around at this place. <laughs> Um, sort of like if you know a certain actor or actress has played this character and then you read that character in a book, you sort of, or at oh, least yeah. I sort of envision them as yep. the character. Um, but I didn't have that experience. I found that it stood on its own. It didn't need me to project my friend Lisa into it. Wow. Uh, although you were obviously the main protagonist, mm -hmm. it was, um, there were so many things to think about and, 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 um, and observe, I would encourage beach season is coming up, depending on when people are listening to this. It's Thank coming you. up now while we're recording. Um, the the one regret I have about that book, not regret, but uh, the people who made Corner Gas read it with the idea of making a series out of it, and then they passed. Oh, yeah? They, uh, they approached me, yeah, uh, and uh, then they passed on it. I was excited about that. I thought, wow, this could be really cool, but no. Well, you never know. Such is life. That doesn't necessarily mean no forever. No. Nope. Lots more production companies out there, Lisa. That's Maybe true. somebody will listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, other than you and me, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> so I think they will. then uh, on to the next uh, really great beach read. Uh, my sepsis story came next, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Venus Rising was um, in between, but... Um, but that was the one that you had already written, and then did you self-published yeah. that? Yeah, that I had to online? just update it, yeah. yeah. And then, then my sepsis story I wrote because I was just so amazed by how few people knew what sepsis was. And of course, until I got sick with it, I was one of them. Well, and you didn't know for a good long time. We're going back now here in the conversation to when you were at 103.9 and all of a sudden you became very sick. And, uh, the and doctors you, kept telling me I had the flu. Yeah, You didn't, it was a good amount of time that you didn't have it diagnosed, wasn't it? Well, it, it moves pretty fast. So, um, they figured that it probably set in, it was maybe, it, it was less than two weeks, I think. Um, but I was about six hours away from a permanent coma by the time I got seen. And you know what, uh, Kevin, I was so lucky because 
you know, I was, here's the, the gist of the story is I was misdiagnosed and everybody kept telling me, look, this doctor says the flu and I'm walking around telling everybody who will listen, it's not the flu. And I have nothing else to tell them that it is. I didn't know about sepsis. If I had known, I would have put my foot down and said, sepsis, test me for that. It's a blood test. It's simple. I would have raised hell, but never, I had nothing. I'd never even heard of it before it exactly, happened Exactly, exactly. And it's so common. Um, so when I c- called 911 uh, and I kept – keep in mind, I'm going in and out of consciousness at what, this point. So what was it that caused you to – well, maybe you just answered my next question. So it had been a couple of weeks and you're you keep continually being told you have the flu and you get to a point you call 911. What – was that trigger that finally made you say to heck with it? I'm calling. How graphic do you want me to be? Eh. I peed blood. Pretty big sign. Yeah, that's b- more than the flu. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That'd be a pretty bad flu. Yeah. Especially when I was getting up in the middle of the night and running to the, to the faucet and drinking five or six glasses of water and, and not going to the bathroom all day. I was waking up in bed, putting a blanket around myself, walking to the couch and going back to sleep for five or six hours. Like I was going into a coma. But so when I, I actually looked at my phone and thought, do I have what it takes to call 911 or do I just go to sleep? I had that thought. Do I just go to sleep? Because sleep was so attractive at that time. But when I got, when the ambulance got there, oh, and by the way, one of the ambulance attendants treated me like dirt because he thought I had the flu and was like, what are you wasting our time for? He was so mean. Anyway, I got an apology. But anyway, so when we got to the hospital, it was just before they went into, went into that code, I forget what it's called, where the, the ambulances back up and they can't offload patients. I got in like 20 minutes before that. If I had gotten stuck backed up in an ambulance with those poor ambulance attendants having to sit there because they can't offload me because the ER is full. I might not be here today. When I got into the ER, the doctor looked at me and talked to me a little bit and he kept having to wake me up and uh, took my blood and stuff. And he came back and he said, you are extremely ill. And I said, thank you. Thank you. And I just sobbed and then fell back to sleep. But uh, it was just the relief of knowing, okay, I'm here. They're going to help me. Somebody's finally listening to me. So what did they do to be able to pull you back from that ledge? They, well, first they had to figure out where it was coming from, but they, they just pumped me full of antibiotics. I was on antibiotics 24 hours a day for five, six weeks, something like that. Um, at the bike show that year, the motorcycle show, the world of motorcycles expo, I, I had the fanny pack over my shoulder with my antibiotics in the tube in my, in my arm. Um, my brother took me and, uh, I lasted about 20 minutes and then he had to bring me back home. Um, yeah, so it was just 24 seven antibiotics. I'm telling you, my nails grew like never before. My skin cleared up. I look fantastic. Antibiotics. They're amazing. (laughs) But they thought they were going to have to, you know, at first there was all this mystery about it. They thought at first that maybe my liver was full of cancer and they would have to find another liver, which of course takes about three years. Uh, Of course, my dad uh, had just had his knee replaced and he was in a hospital at the same time. And, and um, when I first made a phone call to him and I said, they're trying to figure out whether they have to operate or take my liver out or whatever. And he said, you can have mine. I said, well, dad, you only need a part a little bit of it and he regenerates. He goes, I don't care. Take the whole thing. And and that's like, that's a dad, right? And he's, you know, he would have brought it over to me if he could. Uh, And I thought that was just the sweetest thing when like, dad, it's okay. I think I'm going to be all right. But, uh, but that's a, that's a daddy's love right there. So you wrote about that whole experience as well. And that's available uh, on Amazon and everywhere else you can get what digital books as well, I guess. Yeah, and now that you know, since Patty Duke's death, people are more are more familiar with sepsis, and I'm grateful for that. What was it like for you um, to relive all that, to be able to write it down? Well, I'm actually surprised I'm not tearing up right now because I usually do when I talk about it, um, and I think part of the reason of writing it 
well, I know part of the reason of it was for therapy for myself because it was just, um, traumatic and, um, to get that close and to feel like I was just crying in the wilderness. Nobody was listening to me for so long too. That was hard. That was very hard. Um, to know that I was, I was saying to everybody, you know, I know this is not the flu and they were all saying, and they, nobody seemed to, to believe me. That was difficult. Um, now in, in this house, I am considered a doctor. I'm an honorary doctor and anything I say about health, we check out. That's just the rule. And, uh, it goes for the animals. It goes for my husband. It goes for everybody. Nobody ever doesn't listen to me again. Back kind of to where we started almost through all of these adventures and all of the ones that we haven't even begun to address. What have you learned about yourself and just about life in general? Um, I stopped having expectations uh, many years ago and it made my life a lot easier. I found that I'm more pleasantly surprised when something good happens. I enjoy it more. I don't get disappointed like I used to. I don't build people up beyond maybe where I ought to because they're just human and they're flawed like me. I don't build myself up that way. I don't have my expectations of myself, my, myself are to do well, to do very well, not to be perfect. Um, that's something that I've learned. My life is so much better and so much easier since I came to that conclusion that perfection is unattainable and frankly, not even wanted because I want to continue to grow and develop. And, um, I'm still curious. There are things I want to learn. There are things I want to do. I don't think I know everything. Um, when I teach at Fanshawe in the, the journalism course, you know, everybody gets, I tell them all the time, if you don't agree with me, I want to, I want to know, and I want to know why, and let's talk about it. And maybe I'll change my mind, but for now, this is how I, this is how I see it. If there isn't an ebb and flow to, <clears throat> pardon me, to the way you see things and the way you do things, then you're not learning and growing. So that's where I'm at now. And, and, um, it's been a, a long journey to get here, but uh, worth every step. It's fun to finally have, say finally, it's fun to have this conversation with you and I've learned a lot. You, to me, have been uh, uh, a good friend, a source of light, a source of encouragement. You happen to be married to one of my most favorite people in the entire world, and yet uh, I'd love you anyway. Um, and I don't know that you and I have ever really even talked about that. Even though we actually go to work during the day in the same place, we almost never see each other. I see the top of your head sometimes, but you look busy. <laughs> so I don't want to come over and interrupt. I have done it a few times, but I don't want well, to. Well, and it's funny how um, life goes by. And I wasn't intending this when I started this little podcast project, but what it's turned into is almost a forced socialization and catch up with people that I like and respect and find interesting. And um, with what you were just saying about not building people up because they're just human, this seems to be a theme that's running through each of these discussions is that, you know, we look to others. I've always looked to you as I've looked up to you ever since I met you. I've admired your various skill sets. I've aspired to be like you and like Derek in a lot of different ways. But admittedly, Lisa, I haven't paid a lot of energy and attention to all of the various pains and challenges and things that you've gone through that everybody goes through. We all yeah, take our turns. Absolutely. And I, uh, if, if we, if anybody can take anything away from these kinds of discussions is that, you know, we're all, um, dealing with different things and, you know, everybody has a story that'll break your heart. It's it, so true. And everybody has the strength and the resolve and, or, or the ability to, to access those things, to be able to find their way through it and to learn about themselves and, and to find a good place. It seems to me sitting here beside you that you're in a pretty good place right now and are, are pretty content with how life I is. I am. I'm, I really am. I'm happy. And, you know, I mean, I'm tired and oh, I get up at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. But I work with Mike Stubbs. He's the greatest guy. I'm in my my field of, you know, my professional field, 
which is a lot more than a lot of great people can say right now in this business. There are a lot of really great, talented, experienced people out of work that are looking for some way to make a living. I feel lucky. And gratitude and luck um, are a couple of big themes with me. So, yeah, yeah, I'm happy. And plus, you know, I got this former long-haired guy who uh, who is just a great partner in every way, and I feel lucky with him, and I've got nothing to complain about. Well, I feel largely the same way, and I'm really grateful that we got the chance to do this. Thanks for making the time. Yeah, yeah me too. This is fun. I encourage you to find Lisa online at voiceoflisabrandt.com. Lisa's last name is spelled B-R-A-N-D-T, voiceoflisabrandt.com. At her site, you're going to find all her blog postings, as well as information on each of her books and links to follow to purchase them, audio samples of some of her work, her social media feed links are there, and even some really cool items in the shop page called Lisa's Pieces. Go have a look. There's some neat stuff there. I'd like to thank Lisa for taking the time to join me on the show. As for me, would love for you to join me on Facebook at facebook.com slash noscheduleman or on Twitter at noscheduleman or visit me on my website noscheduleman.com. Remember, you can subscribe to this podcast at iTunes or SoundCloud. All episodes are also available on YouTube. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you next time on the No Schedule Man Podcast. Podcast.